Top Bed Talk. Welcome back to EdPom USA, live from Charlotte in North Carolina in the USA. I'm Monty Mython, introducing this session on behalf of my colleagues. This is the lunchtime session as part of the value proposition for perioperative medicine. I'm co-chairing with the overall chair of the meeting, Sol Aronson. Sol. Hi, Monty. Thank you for co-chairing with me. <laughs> so in the interest of time, we're going to dive straight in and say hello to two guests, starting off with Sam and then Karen, who are going to introduce themselves. And Sam, on behalf of Medtronic, you're going to lead this session. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks to Ebpom and everyone for bringing Karen and I here and giving us the opportunity to help uh, participate in this important event that addresses such an important set of issues. I'm Sam Ajizian. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of the Patient Monitoring Operating Unit in Medtronic. You know us through things like pulse oximetry, anesthesia level monitoring, as well as near-infrared spectroscopy and capnography. And I'm joined today by one of my colleagues inside the company, Dr. Karin Phillips. Thank you, Sam. My name's Karen Phillips. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for the Respiratory Interventions Business at Medtronic. I'm an anesthesiologist and adult critical care doc and met Monty in my first year of my residency in Cape Town, South Africa. Steady now, steady. <laughs> <laughs> you know my business for the McGrath Mac video laryngoscope, the full range of DAR and Mallinckrodt tubes and filters, and of course our Puritan Bennett ventilators within the ICU. So it's great to be here. We wanted to just kind of tag on to the discussion that was so robust earlier this morning and really the theme of the entire conference, which is the value around perioperative care. And I'm happy to, that Dr. Kirk is here from Duke representing our surgical colleagues on the other side of the drape because, as he said earlier today, that patient is at the center of everything we're doing, but there's a surgical relationship there. And as anesthesia providers, we can't ignore that. And our company, as you know, makes a lot of surgical stuff too. So we're present in a unique relationship with our surgical colleagues and our anesthesia colleagues. And I think when we talk about the business approach to helping create value in this space, we look at, just like any other business, what are the gaps? How do you fill them? Well, we're a medical device company. So we fill gaps with devices. And traditionally, we filled gaps with stuff that sticks on a patient, is connected to a box by a wire, right? And you all know what those things are, and all of our competitors make those too. So those kinds of solutions are really not going to play well in the perioperative, particularly the preoperative space, or the distant postoperative space when the patient's at home recovering. So clearly, the technological gaps, if we're going to monitor patients and inform our decisions with physiologic data, have to center around usable, cost-effective, connected monitoring solutions. Now, first of all, we have to ask, do you all want that? Do you all want to see data on me preoperatively for seven days? What's my blood pressure like? What's my blood glucose doing? How deeply do I desaturate at night when I'm asleep? So we have to be careful what we wish for here, and we're not trying to turn preoperative patients into ICU patients. What we're trying to do is create a cost-effective way to look at trends that are meaningful preoperatively and safe monitoring postoperatively that also connects to the mainframe of your digital world. So short answer from me is yes, but. And the but is, are we at risk of identifying things that we don't quite understand the relevance of yet? So, oh, absolutely. So, so, so this yes. is the fun, Monty. <laughs> this is the fun part. Well, uh, unless it results in inappropriate cancellations or delays, etc. Et so from the blood pressure perspective and blood pressure management, absolutely. From the other things, how much understanding do we have to do before we get too deep into it? Yeah, it's a great question. So this group and those that are listening know better than I do the types of perioperative monitoring that's happening now. I know at Wake Forest there's uh, a project using some sort of wearable device to get some parameters helping to inform preoperative care. What we're going to do in this space is we're going to walk into your house and we're going to put new windows in the back wall. And now we're going to look out on things we've never seen before. And we've got to work through that as a specialty. And as a business partner there, um, we may, uh, through the AI side and machine learning side, uh, be able to help pick up those trends a lot earlier than what we're used to doing it in our standard ways, looking at thresholds. So there's got to be a partnership there. But you're right, Monty. We're going to potentially 
know more about our patients. I don't think that's a bad thing as a practitioner. I think I want to know rather than, you know, play it by ear. But there will be considerable resistance in the community to say, hey, I do my job great. I don't need that. Question from the audience. From Duke University. I think the key linchpin here is whether we're getting data about our patients or getting information about our patients. There's tons of data, more data every single day, more than anyone can look at. We don't need more data. We need it synthesized into useful, actionable information. And that curation of the data is probably the most important thing that companies like Medtronic can help us with, is, is parsing through what's meaningful, what's actionable, and delivering that to the bedside as opposed to having to walk through a mountain of things that are irrelevant. And where are we in that journey, do you think, Alan? Are we at the gathering data to turn it into information, or are we ready to go mainstream? I think that we know enough about certain things to parse out what's really important. Some of the things that were talked about earlier, you know, anemia and glucose control. I mean, we have some pretty good things that can be surfaced on that. But, you know, every step someone took, no, we probably don't need that. Uh, maybe we need a, a score of total ambulatory change or something like that. But, but there, there are many things I think are ready for prime time, many things that are plausible, and then there's a lot of stuff that is just you know, going to be piled on top of us that we don't need at all. And it's working through those things that are going to be important. I agree with you. And I think you know, when we look at the first two words of this organization, it's evidence-based. Mm-hmm. It's linking that stuff, all those bits and bytes of information, and using that through generating evidence to truly show that it changes outcomes. And I know that sounds a little bit pedestrian, possibly, but I think what we do have is data overload, but we really are not very good at demonstrating why it makes a difference and why we should change anything. In the former session, you raised an excellent point around the partnership between the surgeon and the anesthesia provider. We don't ever see our patients again. Hopefully, that's the goal, right? I mean, it's the running joke. You know, you know you've done a good job as an anesthesiologist when your patient doesn't remember you. But the reality is it's going to be you who's going to be following up on that patient and possibly be dinged either from a reimbursement perspective or certainly from a patient load perspective if you incur those complications or the patient does. And so when we're trying to demonstrate value, it's not just what the payer sees, It's actually the long-term outcome. If the patient has terrible kidneys and we don't pick it up beforehand and then I as a provider do a shocking job of fluid management, you're the one who's going to be faced with the complications and the patient and the patient's primary care provider. So I think it's around what we do with that information. We're so good at saying, tick the box. We've got all of these labs, all of these x-rays, all of these steps counted. So what? And that's where I think we could do a better job as we think about products to invest in, new technologies to make workflow better, make outcomes better. What do we do with the data? And it's around generating the right kind of evidence. So the whole data and AI and machine learning and you know, outcomes, you know, relationships to those sorts of data points is so sexy right now, and it's the buzz. I think to the point that Alan made earlier, how do you transition data to information? How do you transition information to, you know, signals that we should really be alerted to is the bingo. I don't know how well we're doing in that journey, but I would ask that we parse it into these spaces. There's the here and now. We need to see if we're on the road or if we rolled over to the shoulder. So you need signals for here and now. Because we all have behaviors that we react to based on here and now. You need to have signals that give you insights into where we would likely end up if we didn't adjust because it guides behavior. And then you need to somehow coalesce all of that stuff to give us better predictive models and things of that nature. And there are almost three different swim lanes with respect to data as we see and know it. Well said. You just described the, you know, whatever your sports analogy is, the three periods of a hockey game. You just described the next three iterations of 
wearable, semi-continuous, continuous data coming from patients. That the first period is what Alan's worried about. I don't want to see like a giant flow chart and pre-op clinic when someone comes in, then I need to look at all these thresholds. I don't want alarms coming to me. I don't want to know all this stuff that hasn't got value. But that's really, to your point, the way we all practice now. We kind of look, the light's flashing, there's a sound going off, and we react and do something, right? That's how we are trained from day one. And if you think about it, all our monitors look the same. Big numbers on the right, squiggly lines on the left. So naturally, when we think about a monitor, we think about it that way. That's going to be fine in some areas, like maybe on a ward that's understaffed in the first period of the game. The second period of the game is figuring out how do we package this data so that it's meaningful for you and your practice and for him and his practice. And that's what we're calling the homogeneous problem that has heterogeneous solutions. So if we come up with the right tech then you can customize it for each of your practices for what is important for you. If it's Chris looking at his total joints in Arkansas, you can come up with a protocol that helps drive meaningful metrics and follow meaningful things and may be predictive. And then in the third part of the game, through years of this being on patients and an expanding universe of data, the algorithm engineers are spitting out things that are actionable, predictive, and preventive. So when you're pre oping me, you don't look at a bunch of lines. You see at risk for PONV, consider whatever. That's the end game. And that goes into the post-operative phase too. Looking at trends of vital signs on a personalized basis can allow us to predict and prevent things before a rapid response occurs. So you won't get that pat on the back of running in and tubing someone and taking them to the ICU and saving their life, you'll get a message that says, you know, Dr. Mython is at risk for sepsis or a thrombotic event or whatever. So your data will come to you in different ways. It'll still be actionable. It'll still require medical intervention and thought process. We're not going to close the loop with devices probably in my lifetime in critical care. But that said, we'll need to be accepting of being informed in different ways that empower workflow and earlier action. Pick off those three sections for the next week. Wearable at home the week before surgery, I think, yeah. was what you were suggesting. Is there something that's ready for prime time now? Or well, are, we, are we still on a voyage of discovery? It, it depends. Prime time is what, from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. on TV, right? <laughs> so there might be some things in prime time that I don't really want to watch and things mm. that you want to watch. Mm. So I think, you know, like every good doctor, I'm going to say, it depends. Okay. It depends the gap you're trying to fill. If you're, let's say, super bent on doing research in the preoperative phase to look at outcomes, then yeah, there are some solutions out there. But for us, being a global company with so much responsibility, we want to enter the arena, if you will, with a device that really can be customized in all the ways that you want to use it. So the answer to that right now is not yet from our standpoint, but very soon. So more to come. Sam, I'm going to take that answer and I'm going to ask you to pivot a little bit. It has been my experience, and I'm sure you would support this, that traditionally the relationship between consumer and provider of the asset, you know, the provider has been the customer and we'll buy it or we won't. We'll accept it or we'll reject it based on our sense of need and or, I guess, trust, right? Where is the payor in that dynamic? When will industry turn to the payer as a customer? If you have analytics or you have screening tools that will label somebody as red and not green and it makes a difference if they're red or not green who needs to know that and is the payor somebody who should know that and when will they ever be your customer yeah Hmm. customer i don't know if it's the right word but you're bringing up a great point they have so much ownership in the process Mm -hmm. that it would be not smart from a business standpoint to ignore the value that those kind of devices can create for them Speaking at a high altitude level, we're already doing that work with major payers to understand the value of these devices in their ecosystem. Because remember, devices like we're talking about can be used in so many different ways, not just in the perioperative space. That's the most important thing for us to talk about today. 
But what if you're a hypertension doc and you manage people with brittle hypertension that are on six meds and you're asking them to take their blood pressure once or twice a day and they freak out and ratchet their pressure up when they do it? What if you're a pulmonologist that takes care of O2-dependent COPD patients who come into your ER over and over and over and, by the way, end up in your operating rooms? So there are lots of places that radiate back to the payer, obviously. Payers want to save money. Obviously, we all do, but we don't want to compromise care, and we don't want to create new work for people in an already limited system from a staffing point. We want to keep people safe, provide early, actionable data, and if we do that, the value is going to be found by everyone. It's that, that's the easy part. I'm going to jump in, Sam, because your business, so <clears throat> patient monitoring is more around the anti-part. It's the pre-operative rather than the... With RI, we're predominantly, respiratory interventions, we're predominantly in the ICU with ventilation. And in answer to your question, we have really ramped up our discussions with needing to engage with payers. Because when one tries to, for example, demonstrate a truly meaningful outcome, fewer days on vent post-op, holy grail, decrease in ventilator-associated complications, massive problem. There are many bundles and many organizations that look at how we do that. If I want to introduce a new feature on a vent, and I want to demonstrate that you're going to get your patients off vent much sooner, or you as a non-invasive way of managing them rather than an invasive way, I have a very different conversation with a hospital CFO versus the payer. Yes. We sit in the world of a bundled DRG. It is very, very difficult to shift the needle if the price is determined. So we are having the kinds of conversations around, can you unlock that DRG? Because right now, if the patient stays in the ICU but isn't ventilated for one or two days but still has the same length of stay, it really makes no difference to the hospital. But the payer might be the one to say, let's look at the granularity of that composition of that stay and that would allow us to shift the needle from a truly financial perspective. Current global audience, can you decode the DRG bit? <laughs> <laughs> ah, that learning curve that I discovered four years ago when I jumped across the pond. Essentially, if you go into an ICU with a diagnosis, pneumonia, and this is relevant particularly in the last two years, there are very clever actuarial types who put a number on how much that in total stay within the ICU is going to cost. That's a code. It's a diagnostic code. I'm sure DRG, but I know it's a bundle code. Diagnostic related. There you go. Diagnostic related group. Group. There you, there you go. I knew what it was. Didn't know what it stood for. Um, the challenge, Monty, is that if that is determined by the length of stay and the diagnosis, what happened during COVID is that the DRG for an admission for pneumonia was no longer a four or five day stay it became a two-week stay. And that really impacted hospitals because from a, from a payer perspective, they didn't have a separate coding for a prolonged stay. It was still still that four or five-day stay, but the hospital is spending 10 or 12 days' worth of resources. It includes labs, includes staffing, consumables, et cetera. So it really cut into how much money the hospital was not being reimbursed for when the patient was going in for pneumonia. If we could, for example, say your DRG code for, for pneumonia, if you're ventilated or unventilated, makes no difference. We know that the first day on vent is significantly more than subsequent days on vent because on that first day you're doing all your initial labs, your initial investigations. But if we, as a, if that code was unlocked and your mode of ventilation was separated from your drugs, it was separated from your consumables, we could go and say, we have this device that enables you to keep a patient off a vent and provide them with high flow or non-invasive or something else. That should have an impact on how much your staff are going to have to work. If you've got a patient who's not intubated, it's significantly better workflow for your nursing staff. That should make an impact to how much your hospital should be benefiting rather than saying it really doesn't matter what mode you're on, they're in the ICU, it's one number only. And so coming back to the payer, it's not only the 
we really have to have that conversation with them. They're the ones who determine what the hospital can bill for. Likewise, the, the codes that doctors are charged or are requesting for their services and their procedures, if you're not having to worry about intubating or re-intubating a patient, but instead are incentivized to keep the patient unintubated at all, for example, that would change patient outcomes because you're keeping them off the vent, the workflow is going to be better, your patients are going to be in the ICU for less, and are likely not going to have any of the ventilator-associated complications that they may have had. But we can't impact that because the way the pay structure is currently. So if I could just bring this to another plane, if you will, in a fundamental way, data, which is a precursor to information, which is a precursor to behavior. Correct. What we learn from those devices that teach us things motivates behavior, and hopefully it motivates good behavior or, you know, appropriate to the scenario behavior that will impact things like outcomes, which will impact value. How can we incentivize good behaviors based on the reliability of the information that we get from the data? And who's the target that we should be focusing on? Yeah, so from a device company perspective, the answer to that, and this is going to seem like a cop-out, is to give you the best technology so you can do it the way that makes the most sense for your system. Because to have an overall global idea about how to do that is probably way too big a scope. These problems are the same in every single hospital, whether you're in the UK, you're in Africa, or you're right here in Charlotte. They just come in little different flavors. But because of that, and because of all the economics of the system and the staffing and all the other variables, the way you have to solve them is different, and incentivization becomes different as well. First and foremost, the provider has to be incentivized to do a better job. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, unfortunately, not for the people in this room, but for a lot of practitioners, they're convinced they do the best job that they possibly can already, and they don't need any help. That's a big resistor to getting things done with incentivization. So you've got to create better connection to the idea of improving. A lot of people are set in their ways. A lot of people are not going to want the kind of technology we're talking about. I do fine. I don't need to see his labs for a week before he comes in or his vitals. That's going to be an adoption curve barrier. But the way you solve these is through different ways of incentivization. If you're Allen and you run a surgical division, surgeons are incentivized monetarily by better outcomes and less complications. So he made it very clear. Data drives that. Show me the device does something like that, and we'll realize it through rewards that help everyone in the system, especially the patients. But if you're in a community hospital, and let's say you're like someone Chris consults for who wants a perioperative experience for their patient, but really can't do it themselves, they bring in an outside person to do it or an outside group, then that's a different form of incentivization. There's got to be a relationship between what I invest in the perioperative group and what they return on that investment to me through better throughput, better patient outcomes, better patient satisfaction, less sentinel events, you know, whatever the metrics are, place to place to place. So the challenge in these positions that Karin and I have is to come up with the tech that kind of works well everywhere but allows us to still practice medicine and find the best ways to get the most out of the devices. But I think further to that, Sam, it's about the partnership between industry and providers. We sit, in a sense, we have an idea of what great tech is, and heaven knows Sam and I are spend a lot of time talking to startups, new device companies. They've made the best things since sliced bread. The challenge is we think it's great, but we need that feedback, that interaction, sitting yeah. down with Pay and yeah. saying, as Sam has just said, does this make a difference? I mean, does this really matter? Is this going to be applicable in your facility? And then the next step would be to engage with that partnership to do the evaluations, to do the limited market releases, to, to truly get a feel for how does this change workflow? Does this make sense in your facility? I might have a product that's great if you've got 25-bed ICU, but if you've got a community hospital, it's not going to make any difference at all. So understanding, making that more workable is really around the partnership. It's getting the feedback from the customer. How do you, generic you, introduce a novel concept idea 
innovation that heretofore has not been in the workflow versus introduce a solution to a problem that is in the workflow. And I, and I think they're very different scenarios. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, we're part of a huge company, right? And we make things like uh, Taver valves. We make things like, you know, other cardiac valves, stents, brain implants, spinal cord stimulators, right? Lots of different things. And the adoption curve for those is very, very different. And in a lot of ways, a lot easier than it is for a monitor or for a ventilator, stuff we use every day and have since we started. And I'm a bit jealous of that, honestly, and my colleagues in those businesses, because we, I think we've got a tougher proposition to prove. So when we come along with a monitor, I, you know, think back to the pulse ox, right? We're old enough to remember, what the heck is that for? Why do I need that? And pushing it around on this big cart, and now it's the fifth vital sign, right? So if you're coming into practice today, there's no adoption curve for pulse oximetry for you. It's just what you do. So what we've got to do is think about how does bringing new monitoring technology to the market create new ways of looking at the patient that are easier and more informative and actionable. That's the key. And that's really hard, Saul. That's the hardest part of our jobs is to translate that inorganic startup kind of picture into a globally applicable, universally a beneficial device. And it's the most fun of what we do, honestly. But it's, it's not easy. So, so I'm going to suggest that the, the conversation we're having here, the lowest hanging fruit at the moment, the sort of greatest immediate opportunity, because it's already what we're trying to do, is ward monitoring, floor monitoring, Yes, if you see what I mean. I mean, that's a, already there's lots of technology coming to to bear that, I mean, that should work here and now. Absolutely, that's the first period of the game. Yeah. Putting it on patients who are not monitored. Monitoring- the In hospital though. To in start. hospital, so let's just talk about the post-operative phase mm. when someone's convalescing on the ward for a few days before they go home. There's a great spectrum of monitoring possibilities that patients experience globally, but let's just talk about the US. I kind of was surprised to learn that a lot of patients on wards aren't hooked to anything. Now, that changed in the pandemic, right? When we filled those wards with hypoxic patients on high flow, high FiO2, non-invasive support. So we stuck pulse oxes on them. But they were still a box in a room with a red light, not connected centrally, right? So Josh is nodding his head as a quality officer. That's great, but it also creates a whole new set of problems because now we can't hear the monitor down in that end, end room on the hall. We can have an event. So we have all this opportunity to monitor better. What we don't have is the opportunity to rip out all of our walls and ceilings and put a whole new infrastructure in. No one has got that money anymore. If you do, please raise your hand as a system. I'd like to know how you're doing it. But seriously, we've got to find ways that mirror the rest of our digital life. The rest of our digital life. Just think about that for a second. Would you want someone to put a new Wi-Fi in your house and rip out the walls and charge you $100,000? Not possible. So why aren't we doing this in the medical world? Why aren't we doing this for patients? And the answer is, we haven't had the technology yet. And a big barrier to that technology, not only has been the right form factor and all the stuff fitting inside the right form factor, but it's also connecting to our electronic medical records. That's a barrier, and that's taken time to solve to do it in a cost-effective, non-rip-and-replace way. So now that we're getting to the point where we have technology like that, you can basically take a multi-parameter monitor the size of a quarter, put it on a patient, and connect it however you want to wherever you want. That will give you the same kind of monitoring that you have in the ICU, squiggly lines and numbers, but it will also give you actionable data that with some very early basic machine learning can bring you to the table a little earlier in the deterioration cycle. So what that means is if you've got a 1 to 12 ward, one nurse with 12 patients on a Saturday night, he can sit there with the interface of his choice, whether it's an iPad, a phone, monitors in the hallway, any of the above, all of the above, and be able to get actionable data early. You'd also let your patients sleep through the night. How many people have been woken up at 2 a.m. to get their vital signs taken? 
you know that probably impacts your patient satisfaction scores, not to mention their sleep-wake cycle. There's all these downstream effects of doing this in a hands-off way that, again, we haven't discovered yet, but will probably be beneficial. Further to that, though, Monty, we, this is a, one of Sam's products, the, the combination SATS oximetry microstream. We came across a really interesting phenomenon that occurred when it was at the beginning of the opiate crisis, we were trying to do exactly that, do ward monitoring for any patient who's had narcotics intraoperatively monitoring to intervene should they have a respiratory event. What we discovered was further to the technology, it's also about education and workflow, and that the number of patients who had a microstream device, which had both oximetry and capnography, the capnography was just not being linked up. It was just not being hooked up. So the second part of that is to engage the workforce, to explain the value proposition, to encourage a change in behavior, because no matter how wonderful the box is, if that one nurse sitting with 12 patients in the middle of the night doesn't attach one of those monitors, it's useless. Value gone. Now, we are sadly for this session just about out of time. Sam, Karen, any final comments? Yes, one opportunity. You know, for those of you that may be monitoring in the preoperative space already or even in the extended postoperative space, there are CMS codes for remote monitoring. You should know those and you should bill for them. You're already doing the work. You should get the credit. The numbers are not huge, but when you scale them, particularly on the level of some of the institutions and systems here, you can discover meaningful margin to help drive your perioperative experience improvement measures in your institutions. I don't know if I can further add to that, except that the perioperative space includes the ICU. And I think we focus a lot on the ward, but that the expensive therapy unit is also a place where value truly does mean a change in monetary outcome. Well, thank you. And a very big thank you to Medtronic for their generous sponsorship. Without our sponsors, we would not be able to make all of our podcasts free and open access to the world. We're listened to in around 100 countries around the world. We're now coming up to millions of downloads over the last few years. And it would not be possible without this partnership and the sponsorship. So thank you on behalf of the the world. (laughs) You're most welcome. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for having us. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out ebpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now.